My apologies on this day, not a lot of apologies, but a couple apologies. Uh, today's a camp sermon. When I saw this Jeremiah passage was the lectionary text for today, uh, it was impossible to resist. This is a camp sermon. I preached this text every week, once a week, all summer long. And so it's impossible for me to skip sharing the message that I had for those children with you. Uh, it's worth noting, when we read Jeremiah to the kids, we stopped just a little bit sooner uh, than I did. We skipped the bits about destroying nations, and we focused on this question of potter and clay. How many of you, and I'm going to do this the way I did it at camp, so this is audience participation time. How many of you have ever thrown clay, have ever used a potter's wheel? Oh, I got a couple... Yeah, okay. All right, Vicki, tell me about it. What do you do? Okay, you got, you got some clay. Now what? It's a machine. So is it... Okay. So the, this machine, it's like a... It's, what, what, what does the machine look like? Oh, it's got a, oh, a spindle. And then, I'm sorry, I heard a... It's a wheel. So like a wheel? Oh, oh, like a wheel. Okay. So we've, we've got a wheel. It goes around this way. There's a spindle in the middle. There's some sort of clay. And then what happens? I've got clay on the wheel. What do I do now? Yeah. You mold it. Okay, so, okay, so I, oh, water. Put some water on it, and I mold it with my hands. And it's, it's staying still while I do that? Oh, Okay. So now, if I've seen correctly, it's kind of like a, like a sewing machine. You've got the, 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 yeah, this pedal thing, and as you pedal, it spins the wheel, and as the wheel spins, you sort of put your hands on the clay, and it makes a thing. Yeah, you shape it. What, what kinds of things do you make on a potter's wheel? I'm sorry, vases or vases? I heard both. I asked the kids that one time. I said, Does it, is it vases or vases? And, and they were like, well, both. And I said, what's the difference between a vase and a vase? And one, one really bright young one said, 30 bucks. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. So vases, vases, what else? Pots. Bowls. Cups. Flower pots. I think I heard teapots. Vases. Okay, we did vases. Very... <laughs> yeah, so a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, Christian uh, potters will, will write a little a little message, a little signature, and a little verse or, or or something. Yeah, okay. So now, what do all of those things that we've just rattled off? What do they have in common? They're made of clay. By, oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I'm going to jump back for a second and say you've you've got this clay, and once you're done spinning it, what do you do next? You have to heat it up. You've got to put it in a big oven called the kiln, and, and, uh, and it's, it's actually, sometimes I tell the kids that you bake it, but there's a special term for this. You fire it. You fire the clay. And sometimes you can put some glaze on there, a little bit of glass, and when you fire it, it makes this pretty, very, very cool stuff. Okay, so vases, teacups, bowls, cups, all these things, what do they have in common? They're round. They're shaped. They're full of stuff. Thank you, Dana. They're full of stuff. You put, you put things, you know, if you have a vase that you don't put flowers in, that's kind of a sad vase. And if you have a bowl that you don't put soup in, that's kind of a sad bowl. Yeah, you can eat out of them or drink out of them, but it's always something that you fill with something else. Jeremiah is sent by God to go down to the potter's house. Now, if I want a bowl or a cup or a mug or a teapot or whatever, I go down to Target or... Bed Bath & Beyond, or whatever, and I buy one. And mostly they're made of plastic. Uh, some of them I can get I, I can get ceramic, but, you know, it's kind of expensive. A little, a little bit more money. Stoneware. All sorts of stuff. But I can, you know, I can go down to, to Target, or even, I feel like, uh, down at Hannaford, they'll have cups. Plastic cups or something. I can find something to fill up with water, or juice, or soup, or nuts, or whatever, very easily. But in the time of Jeremiah the prophet, if you wanted a container, if you wanted a big jug or a little jug or a 
a vase or a bowl or any of those things, the only place that you could get them was from the potter. The potter was a critical member of the community. You needed the potter so that everybody could eat. Everybody could bake. Everybody could drink. You needed to have a potter. So every town had somebody whose expertise was pottery and made their vessels out of clay. That's just the way it was. So Jeremiah is sent by God down to the, the local equivalent of the Bed Bath and Beyond, down to the potter's house, and said, God says, look through the window. And he goes and he looks into the potter's house, and here's the potter at the wheel, shaping the clay. And as he's doing it, the clay in his hands, and the translation I use today says, it was spoiled in his hands. And I've heard a couple other translations. I've heard it was flawed or it was marred. Something happened and the cup or vase or bowl or whatever the potter was making was ruined in his hands. It just broke. It, it kind of, I, I don't know any of you who've, who've spun pottery before, but have you ever had a pot that you were working on and all of a sudden it just sort of went, <laughs> no reason, it just kind of, like a flan in a cupboard. That maneuver, God says, you know, Jeremiah sees this happen, and God says, that right there, this is what's happening with Israel. It's gone flawed. It's sort of flopped over, and it's not fulfilling my hopes and expectations for it. And so the potter chooses to continue spinning and to remake the vessel as seems good to him. Now, I could be very wrong about this, but when you, the, you, you potters in the audience, when you have a pot that fluffs on you, what do you do? Do you... Do you and start again, with the same clay or do you get new clay? My understanding is that with some, like with a really, really high quality stuff, the more you work the clay, the less good it is. So in, in some cases, and actually different translations will list this differently, sometimes God remakes the pot, as seems good to him, and sometimes he takes the clay and just goes, Whoop, and gets new clay, does something different. And God says through Jeremiah the prophet, he says, O oh, Israel, you are the clay to my potter. Can't I do whatever it is I want to do with you whenever you get messed up? Can't I use you just the way the potter has used this clay? There's this weird ambiguity for me in this passage in Jeremiah because as a potter, I've done a little pottery. I just wanted to check and see if you guys knew what we were talking about done a little pottery in my time, and I know that it's very easy for the clay to just not do what you want, to just sort of flop over and not behave. And I know from my experience as a pastor, from my experience of life as a human being, I know that people are the same way. We, for no discernible reason, just sort of flop over. We get messed up. It's not anybody's fault. There's no malice in it, but we just collapse. And to me, that is the very heart of sin. And I think, stretching the metaphor probably far too far, too far I think that one of the chief reasons that we become marred, flawed, ruined, is because we decide that we want to be the shape that we want to be. We decide what we want our shape to be. We know what shape we want to be under the potter's hand, and so we try and make ourselves into that shape, and we mess it up, and we ruin ourselves. And that takes us, tangentially, you'll see what I'm doing here, to the gospel passage. My friends, I love it. When the Gospels get tough. When the Gospels get tough, the tough get the Gospel. Something like that. I can think of fewer, few tougher passages in all of the Gospels than this one in Luke's Gospel. There's these two rather nice parables sort of at the end there. They're kind of reassuring. You know, they're, 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 they're full of this, this hint of promise and they connect a little with Jeremiah. The tower builder and the mighty king, these two people who, before they embark on a great expedition, before they plant the foundation of a tower, or before they send out their armies to do battle, 
they step back and they check in with the bean counters. They double check, okay, do I actually have the money to build this tower? Am I going to be able to finish it? Do, do I actually have the troops to fight this war? Is it going to come to a successful conclusion? And there's something really wise about that. I, I tend to be a, a sort of shoot from the hip kind of guy. I tend to just sort of charge ahead and not really check my resources before I get into something. But I've learned through some poor experiences that that doesn't always work. And that you have to stop and assess. You have to stop and check what the cost is going to be before you dive into something. So let me be clear with you on this. Before we embarked or embark on the Christian life, which is, I submit to you, not a choice that we made once and we're done with it, but is rather a choice that we have to make and renew every day. It's a commitment that we rebuild every time we remember our baptism. Before we embark on it again today, it's worth counting the costs, the expenses that we will undertake in order to build our faith on God. We have to give something up in order to be God's people. And one of the first things that we have to give up is our sense of our own shape. We have to submit ourselves to God's molding. As I was talking to the kids about this passage, one of the things that makes me most reassured about Jeremiah and most nervous about Jeremiah is this idea that God has his hands on me. Not from afar. God isn't sort of psychically molding me into a shape. There's something deeply intimate about this metaphor. Those of you who've thrown pottery before, those of you who've ever played with Play-Doh, you know that there's something really squishy about clay, about feeling it in your fingers, about feeling the dust of it on your hands when you're done. There's something really intimate about clay. And that's how God shapes and forms us. It's not distant. It's not divine. It's very, very physical. Spiritual, but physical too. God has his hands on you and me hourly. And I love some of my kids. I, I talked about that a little bit. And some of them went, ooh, that's, that's weird. It's uncomfortable. And I think we'd like to pretend that it's not, but it is. It's uncomfortable. We have built through the years this idea of our own shape of who we are, our identity, our personality, what it is that we do and where it is that we go, the things that matter about us. We've built this idea up in our heads. My brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, that's our shape that we've chosen and is not God's shape for us. We must submit ourselves to God's molding. We must give up on the grounds of our own identity. We must surrender the things that we think define us. Christ doesn't pull punches here. I went and checked. Went back to the Greek because, you know what, it would be really nice if when the Gospel says, if anyone does not hate his mother and father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. It would be nice if there was some way I could soften that for you. Say, no, 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 it's okay. It doesn't really mean hate. God speaking metaphorically. Now, I went back and checked. Dug into the Greek. Jesus says exactly this. If anyone does not hate. It's the same word that gives us misogynist or misanthrope. That's not vague dislike. That's not discomfort with. That is hate. The one who does not hate relations mother and father, wife and child, brothers and sisters, cannot be the disciple of Christ. And I think sometimes it, the temptation, because the language is so strong, is to interpret this verse as if Christ is annoyed. You know, oh, you people, you're, you're not we're doing this hard enough. If you don't hate these other people, you can't really follow me. This is not annoyance or emotion or... Frustration on Christ's part. This is a statement of fact. 
To truly walk the walk of Christ, to follow Christ's teaching, teachings, requires ultimate sacrifices, ultimate surrender. It requires taking on a shape that God ordains that may look nothing like the shape that we expect or desire for ourselves. It requires taking up the cross, filling yourself with God's will and purpose. We, too, by the way, like the vessels that you throw in, potter, in, in pottery, we are meant to be filled. Not to be empty, not to sit on a stand somewhere and be ornamental or decorative. We are meant to be filled with things. With grace, with love, with hope, with joy, with grief, with sorrow, with hope again. We are meant to be filled. God is shaping us and molding us to be the best vessels that we can. And not only to be filled, but also to fill. It's one thing to be full of the love and joy of Jesus Christ and to put the lid on and hide yourself away. That is not our call, my friends. Our call is to be full of the things that God would fill, would fill us with and to pour them out again for one another for our neighbors, for the stranger, the homeless, and the weary. But we can't do it. We cannot fill ourselves or be filled by God if we're clinging to the shape that we think we should cling. So, give it up. Surrender. Let go of the things that are flowing you in your potter's hands, the idols that are the source of all of your ills. Let them go. You know what they are, each of you. You know what costs there are that prevent you from following the financial analysis, the emotional analysis of your life that stops you from truly being Christ's disciple. You know. Let it go. God has a call and a mission for you. God has a new shape in store for you. Surrender yourselves to the potter's hand and he will make you anew. Amen. Our next hymn is number 393. Take up your cross, the Savior says. <laughs>